And joining us now is the chairman of the Texas House Investigative Committee, Mr. Dustin Burroughs. Chairman, thank you so much for coming on. Thank you for having me. When we read through this report, the amount of evidence to account for what happened that day is overwhelming. Some of the details are disturbing and at times when you just realize the magnitude of the failures on multiple levels, it, it is maddening. When you take this in, into account in its entirety, what sticks out to you? The people of Uvalde woke up that morning and they had a false sense of security. They believed they had systems in place at the school level, at the police force level, saying they were ready for this type of attack. The fact is, they did not. And what I think really sticks out to me is, I know there's other systems similar to Uvalde across the entire state and nation that probably are there, and there's also a false sense of security. That's what really sticks out to me. You, you say in the report that one of the most worrying things is the Texas public education system is massive. We have 5.3 million children in it, something like over 80,000 educational buildings that they are in every day. This is not just a problem in Uvalde. Unfortunately, it, it could be in many more places. What do we need to do with this information in order to uh, ensure that we can improve the security, not just in Uvalde, but everywhere? Yeah, when the speaker formed this committee, he said, we need to know what the facts are. So they appointed me to be an investigator uh, and my committee, we went and we basically figured out, here are the basic facts. We have now reported, we have made our preliminary, not final report to the entire Texas legislature. There are two committees in the Texas House, one in the Texas Senate, that are studying and trying to come up with policy recommendations to make sure that we keep Texas children safer. You know, it's important. We're about to start a school year. I've got three young boys that are in public education I'm gonna to send to school. Like all parents, all grandparents, all people, we wanna make sure that as we start this new school year, we do everything we can to make sure they have a safer school than we, uh, and, and that, not that false sense of security. What does that look like to you? I know that this was a fact-finding committee, right? But I would imagine that your colleagues in the House will be looking to you, who probably has a more thorough understanding of these facts than, than any other member, for guidance on how we respond to this. I, you know, without, without policy that follows from this, this report is just paper, right? Yeah. So how, how will you guide the, the, the House to, to respond to that? You're absolutely right. I have some very strong ideas. You know. What I have done, though, is the committee has said, look, our role is to figure out the facts. I don't want to step on this report by coming out and telling you what I think ought to be done. I will do that. Invite me on very soon, and I'm happy to do that, put my policymaker cap on. But I don't want to distract from the core essence of this. But what I'll tell you right now, because it's in the report, is I don't want a false sense of security around this state. You know, I think that may have been one of the, the issues that really sticks out to me that I mentioned before is if you're not training as though this could really happen, if you're not working every single day at keeping the doors really locked and making sure there were three doors unlocked to the exterior of that building. And the reason being, you Valley residents thought this couldn't happen to us. This couldn't happen here. I want everybody as they start the school year to realize this could happen there and to not be deluded into thinking, no, it can't and actually take some of the policies already in place very seriously. So it, it sounds like for you, this is as much about adhering to the policies that we already have on the books as much as it is uh, updating them and, and perhaps passing new legislation to reflect what we found here. Is that right? Yeah, so I, 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 when I come out, I'll tell you what I think ought to be done. I want to make sure it's very clear and very crystal, and I'll do that very soon. I, you know, I think that's very important, but there's also a 20-member committee in the Texas House that was formed to do that, and obviously I want to give them a chance to digest this and see what they have to say as well. There is a lot of blame to go around, it seems like, in a lot of aspects, from the doors to the communication uh, protocol to the law enforcement response. Uh, multiple levels of failure that all could have kept these children more secure. Um, is there a specific entity or, or uh, a group of people that you see as bearing a disproportionate amount of, of the liability for that failure? No, and, I, and I, I want to be very clear about that. I don't want to blame one person or one thing. I think that's a complete distraction. There is not simple solutions to these complex problems. And I think if we say, oh, it's just because of this thing or that thing that was different, we get lulled into that sense of, well, it's different here, we can fix that. No, it's a more comprehensive, holistic thing I think you have to take a look at. Yeah, absolutely. Governor Abbott just said in a statement 
uh, ju just an hour ago responding to this report. He said that there are critical changes that need to be made in, in response to the Texas House's findings. Have you been in communication with his office at all about what those changes realistically could look like? No, at, at this point in time, I, 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 you know, obviously he has a copy of the report. I made sure of that. Uh, you know, and I, I have not talked to him about you know anything beyond that. Yesterday, I spent the entire day in Uvalde, um, and so you know, not had really an opportunity to visit with him or many other people other than you know getting back. Mm -hmm. you, you have spent a lot of time in Uvalde. How did you feel about how their community responded to learning these facts for the first time? The community's broken. Um, I, I, I can't really describe it. You know, I can, I can tell you some instances where uh, you know, early on we went and actually went to the Rob Elementary School. They opened it up and let us go inside the building and, and, and see mm. what happened there. And there was a man that I saw that uh, had been at some of the committee hearings and he'd been silent. And uh, he was standing on the side and I, I walked over to him and I, I can't really describe the pain on his face. It was different than anything I've ever seen before. It was sad and angry and broken all at the same time. And you, you realize there's a lot of people down there that are feeling that way. And uh, I met with the families and the victims, uh, spent over an hour in a meeting with them that was private, uh, gave them this report and uh, stood there until they had no more questions of me about the facts and details of that. I made sure mm -hmm. to do that to try to pay them the respect I think they deserved. What kind of questions did they have? What, what was at the top of their mind when they finally got to see this? You know, it was wide ranging. And one of the things that we have to be careful not to do is everybody grieves differently and everybody processes it differently. So mm -hmm. one person's question was very different than the others. But you know, that mm -hmm. was a private meeting and out of respect to them. If they want to tell you what questions they asked me, happy to do that. But I couldn't characterize it as one thing or the other, but certainly went through and, and, and some of them has certainly gone through the report and asked me some questions about what was in here. Absolutely. One of the questions that, and I don't want to ask this again in the same way, but I do want to press this point. One of the questions that people around the state of Texas have been asking after yet again another mass shooting is what is going to be different this time? What, what can be done taking the, the facts and, and translating that into policy? Whether it is updated school security measures, more funding for school police, or, or an overview of how um, the, the gunman in this case got access to all of the guns and bullets that, that he used. Um, what, what is your, your thinking in any of that? There's a lot of information in here. These are the basic facts. You cannot form good policy if you don't have a good command of what actually happened mm -hmm. in this incident. We go in increment detail talking about the attacker and his background. Uh, we talk about the schools and their policies they had in place and the shortcomings and failures, you know, with maintenance and doors locked. We talk extensive about law enforcement, also about misinformation and how it's affected there. So when I put my policymaker hat back on, which I'm going to do very soon, and hopefully I can come on and tell you what I think ought to be done, you can take any one of those sections mm -hmm. and really analyze it and look at policy solutions that could help prevent another one of these from happening. Uh, you mentioned the background of the attacker. I think that really is the most disturbing part of this uh, report for me, because when you, when you learn about his background, he was called school shooter as a nickname yeah. by his friends. He would use violent language and, and pictures and, and usernames uh, online. He, he had an interest in, in gore, violent sex, making over the top threats, and then what comes from that on the, on the days that he is buying the things he needs to act on those violent tendencies? Nothing. There, there was no criminal record. There were no uh, warnings. Uh, how does that happen? How do, how do so many of his peers know that something is not right with him? And then the, there seems to be no impediment to, to him um, buying the, the high-powered weapons that he used in, Look, in Uvalde. Th there is no reasonable explanation for the fact that people knew there was something wrong. He became increasingly isolated, started playing violent video games, and obviously you know, took on that persona. Where, to the extent people called him school shooter, mm -hmm. somebody has to say something. And I think it's a lesson for all of our communities. If you see somebody going down this dark path and you start seeing these symptoms, you have to actually give somebody the information to act upon it. You know, the school system. The school system, they, they monitored social media and they had you know, the, the good policies in place to update it, but the problem was he was never in school. 
There was no, you know, he, he basically stopped attending his senior year, the year before that, over 100 different absences. And so there wasn't opportunities for them to do that. But if you start to see these types of characteristics, you know, people have to actually, in the community has to be responsive to it and let somebody know so they can potentially do something about it. Do, do you see a path in the Texas House to providing some kind of legal pathway to uh, providing some, some warning signs, some, some kind of mechanism to where law enforcement um, firearm stores, things like that, can't actually see those warning signs? Yeah, look, I, 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 know, I know everybody wants the headline. What does Burroughs think the policy ought to be on different things? And, and, I'm, and I promise you, I've got some feelings I can't wait to get back and share. What I'm going to tell you is this. With respect to the assignment that we were given to come out with the facts, I'm going to let the report speak for itself for some modicum of time. But, you know, as a lawmaker from Lubbock, Texas, who has strong views on every single subject and every single policy in there, I'm going to take some time and put those to you know paper, and I will share those you know here with the community and with the state and the other leaders, and say these are the things I think we ought to be done and ought to be taken up. I, I understand that uh, that desire. I'm not trying to get a headline here, yeah. right? Um, but again, without. Um, some kind of tangible policy prescription for the words on this paper, then th th that is all they are, right? And I, I know that you know that. Yeah. Uh, maybe you feel it's a little early to, to talk about what can be done. I, I understand that, but um, soon. <laughs> yeah, yeah you, you're right, right? I mean, you have to have policy and accountability that flows from this. Right. You know, but for the past 45 days now, mm -hmm. you know, I have lived in Uvalde, you know, off and on and talking to people and trying to come up with a set of facts that will guide that policy and out of respect for the committee and out of respect for the assignment, you know, I want the facts to speak for themselves for some period of time before Burroughs, you know, comes back out and says, here are the things that, you know, I think we can do from a policy perspective. Okay. Well, let's get back to those facts because another important uh, aspect of this that we saw this week is that, that facts, these facts did not unfold the way that you wanted right? Um, you, you said that your plan all along was to uh, show all of this and, and importantly that surveillance video to the families before the wider public saw that and that, that's understandable but that did not happen. Um, and then it, it, in the report you, you write something that I think is stronger than, than what you said publicly this week. You said, we regret that others under cover of anonymity and for their own motives have sensationalized evidence of this horrible tragedy at the risk of glorifying a monster. Yeah. It, it, is that how you you feel um, the, these other outlets that had um, leaked, in, in your words, the surveillance video, is that how they were acting? I, yeah, and, 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 and my reference is those who leaked it to the news media. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not actually the media itself. Look, I want to be very clear. Our committee drove and wanted the hallway video out so people could see the law enforcement response. We wanted, the, uh, we wanted the families to see it first out of respect for them because we have the opportunity to be in that community and understand the need for that information. But also, I know when we put it in here, the attacker wanted notoriety. Mm -hmm. He does not deserve that. We did not use his name in this report. We would not have used his image in what we actually showed because he does not deserve to get what he wanted. And more importantly, we know there's these communities that are out there online, you know, through these chat rooms where they, you know, like I said, glorify, you know, these monstrous, evil, horrible acts. And I don't want others to see this and think of him as an inspiration. So for that reason, you know, we would have edited out any pictures mm -hmm. or likeness of him. And I think that was the responsible thing to do. And, and look, I'm not trying to criticize anybody who played it or whatnot, but certainly I wanted to share my frustration and what I thought the responsible way to put it out was. And how do you, what do you think the way that that got out was? We, we haven't seen any confirmation yet of, of how these other outlets obtained that video. Do you have any idea of, of that? Will, will there be any kind of um, discussions that, that you have with, with other entities about, about how that happened? I, I don't know. I mean, you know, I, I know it didn't come from our committee because our committee wanted to do it a, a particular way. Right. You know, I don't know who all had access to it, whether it was other elected officials, you know, how many different agencies. And so, you know, this time I also realized we may never know how it got out. Mm -hmm. But I did think it was important to at least lay the foundation for what I think going forward, you know, the appropriate way to do this is and, uh, you know, let the family see it first and let's not, you know, allow somebody who wants notoriety to get what they want. Has it been difficult to balance the concerns for both 
sensitivity to the families and, and objective fact finding and uh, to transparency to both the news and the public. Um, you know, we, we, we have uh, been waiting eagerly as the whole public has for six weeks now to discuss what your committee has, has found. Of course, there is a, a concern for what are the ways to, to find these facts the most objectively. Um, but until now, this has all been behind closed doors. Have you given any thought to how you will balance those concerns in the future? So we, we basically, there's not a manual when you come into the legislature, you know, to actually put on the hat of an investigator. Mm. But we've had investigative committees in the past, and the precedent has always been that we conduct our interviews behind closed doors. And the reason being is we think witnesses are more willing to come in quicker without the spotlight being shown on them and uh, are more candid and conversational with us. Uh, it's the way it's been done in the past, will probably be done in the future, and quite honestly, I think it probably worked. You know, here we are 45 days after the committee was actually formed, and we were able to produce, I think, a very thorough report to be able to deliver to the people to help give some more insight and some foundation to their understanding. So, you know, proud of the work the committee did, proud of the way we went about it, and certainly, you know, uh, maybe it's not the best way, but it's the way that we've done it, and I think it absolutely worked. And I'll, I'll make another aside. There are other committees and agencies out there that can also subpoena any of the witnesses that we have, and they can you know, have them testify you know, in a whole bunch of different ways so the public can see them. So my expectation is if somebody else wants to put somebody you know, up on a stand, you know, cross-examine them, do those type of things for the public to see, they can do that. We're not the only ones mm -hmm. who have that power. It, it, that does bring up, I have been interested to hear how you are coordinating with the many other investigations surrounding uh, U Uvalde. And DPS has an investigation, the Senate has their own committee. How, how does that coordination work to make sure that everybody's on the same page and, and can ultimately um, come together and, and plan our next steps. Have you been talking to, to Senator Perry about the work being done on the other side? Obviously, Senator Perry and I work closely on most things, and I talk to him about a lot of things. But, you know, let me just back up. I really didn't coordinate with anybody. <laughs> uh, you know, we, we had a great committee. It was bipartisan because it's not a Republican, you know, problem or a Democrat problem. And it's all of our problem. And so we got together. We hired some incredible staff, people who have some you know, uh, experience, and we went about it the best way we could, and we just dug in. We started interviewing witnesses, we started gathering evidence, and we got to a point that we thought, at least at this point in time, because of that need for public information, we were in a point to release at least a preliminary report. So we just kind of went about it with, uh, you know, the best way we knew how to do it, which was dig in and concentrate on the shovel and not the pile. Yeah. It, it does seem that now that this is out and uh, the, the Senate still has work to do, there does seem to be a, the need for a little bit of reconciling between the narrative that we have now in the House report and, and some of the narrative that has been coming from the Senate, specifically in terms of, of who bears the brunt of, of the blame. You know, we, we've seen uh, Lieutenant Governor Patrick uh, share r reports from DPS statements that seem to push blame down in, in, onto the local level, um, it, repeating some of the the the, uh, the narratives that DPS has given what hap of what happened that day. This report seems to place far more blame on DPS and other agencies than we have heard uh, since before it was released. What do you make of that disconnect? And, what do, you, what do you hope that people understand about who, who is to blame here from this report? So I, I have not done a comparison and contrast to what you know, any other agency or any other you know, body has actually said. So I don't know how, you know, com, you know, how, how much in uh, agreement we are or if there's any disagreement in there. Let me, let me say this. There were officers in that hallway who knew or should have known there were victims in there that were either being killed or dying. At that point in time, the expectation, the standard was, they do everything they can to protect those lives. Mm -hmm. They did not do that, they failed. You know, whether it was going through the front door, going through the windows, figuring out other ways to distract, do something, that is what active shooter training, you know, requires. They did not do that. Most of those in the hallway, with the best information of that, were at the local level. Mm -hmm. You know, I will tell you though, of the 380 officers who were on scene, not everybody knew or understood the situation. Many of them had bad information or false information. So I want to be very clear in my report. I don't think all 380 had enough information or should they have tried to run in and do things because of what they knew, when they knew it, and how they knew it. But where I am critical is 
this, people kept describing the situation as it unfolded after 10, 15, 20 minutes as chaos. And they were trying mm -hmm. to figure out what to do. You should not have the person in overall command of the situation on the inside of the building. That person ought to be in tactical command, but not overall command. So what I have is, if you show up on scene and it's chaos, you should find out, well, who's in charge here? And if you find out that person on the inside of the building, well, you should say, well, that's not what we were trained to do. Where, where is it? And, and start to ask more questions and after you're asked, you know, offer your guidance or assistance. So I am critical of that for many. Yeah. 376 officers representing 23 different agencies at the local, state, and the federal level. Do you feel like that many officers responding and maybe not having a clear responsibility or, or, or a post reporting to 23 different agencies, did that contribute to that chaos? How do we streamline that process so that when we do have an emergency, we can have as much support as possible without it getting kind of lost in, in the crowd there? So the experts will tell you, and I think you, know, you can visit with them, there is incident management. The NIMS is the National Incident Management that they talk about what do you do when you have multi-agencies respond. That happens all the time and probably happens you know, more going forward. And so there is training out there that basically tells you how do you actually work within there? How do you cooperate? You know, by, uh, by approved, uh, you know, uh, what was submitted, you know, it was the ISD police chief who was supposed to be in charge. Mm. But again, I would tell you, if you're in charge, overall command, you shouldn't be the person with your gun trained inside the building. You need to be outside coordinating all efforts, not just those in there. And so, you know, there was a breakdown about expectations and standards related to kind of that multi-agency response. The, the training exists, the guidelines are there. Many of these officers had that training, uh, but clearly they did not adhere to it. Is, is that a problem of the training regiment that we have right now? Do we need more of it? Or was that the fault of, of these individual officers for getting it? So when we look at what we need in the future, again, you know, that's, that's part of what we're gonna get into here in a short period of time. You know, I don't wanna step on you know, what kind of that next subject is and what needs to be done. But I'll tell you, we do point out that there was obviously failures by officers, you know, whether that was training, experience, communication, or, or making a decision to prioritize their own lives over those of the victims in the room. Mm. You know, that's gonna be on an officer to officer basis. Will officers or even uh, people ranking higher than them lose their jobs over this? I don't know, you know, obviously we report the facts and come out with that and, and the people who are going to have the jurisdiction to make you know figure out what that is and the accountability they have processes they have reviews they have investigations and i assume many of those are underway okay in addition to what we see in the actual report you also say that your committee reviewed hundreds of photographs videos phone calls text messages to try to put a, a better understanding of what happened that day together um, but most of those we do not see. Those, those are still private. Is there anything that didn't come out in, in the report that you reviewed that you think is important for the public to understand? Anything that really stuck with you? Look, I'm, I'm sure, you know, as I sit here right now, I know there's a lot of other information out there. You know, some of it is, uh, you know, body cam footage, other things that we did review that may help contextualize it. But, but, I, but I think that the most critical information to get to the 80 pages we've contained in here, referenced or cited so that you get the understanding of what it is. Is there anything we haven't touched on yet that you, you think is important to know? Um, you know, I mean, the only thing that I would say is, you know, really, you know, the report's broken down in three big, you know, topic areas. It talks about the attacker, you know, and you look at him and obviously, you know, grew up in a broken home, you know, had lots of issues, tried to fit in, you know, and had a lot of things going on in his life that I think people will be interested in, you know, kind of in background. Um, there is obviously, you know, a lot in, in, in look, in the thing that was the hardest part of this to write, was talking about the school district because there were so many good people and teachers who were there that day that, you know, some of them are victims themselves. But what we find is there is a culture of non-compliance mm -hmm. with having locked doors, both exterior and interior. And, uh, you know, you hate to point the finger at them because they're good people. But what I do believe and why we did that is I think there's a lot of schools around the state and around the country where they have these good policies. 
you know, that says keep your exterior doors locked. Have these good policies to maintain doors so they can be locked. Keep your interior doors locked. All those type of things. But I think out of convenience and that false sense of security, that does not happen on a day-to-day -day basis. And so it was important to point that out in this report, not because I enjoyed being critical of the school, but because I want others to learn from it. And that's an important factor. Of course, more locked doors would have kept more children safe. Uh, I, I did notice uh, on the night that you revealed this report, though, there was some criticism on the emphasis that the committee placed on um, certain smaller security measures like that, like uh, locked doors, for example. When the, the biggest contributing factor to this shooting was not an unlocked door, it, it was an 18-year-old with an assault rifle who had bad intentions. <laughs> It, it seemed like the, the, the criticism was that there was not enough focus on how we could have prevented an 18-year-old from getting an assault rifle, simply focused on you know, preventing him from getting into the building for, for a few seconds. There are going to be more bad people, regardless of age, who want to do harm to our children and our communities. Our schools you know, have had policies in place since Columbine. And in 2019, after the Santa Fe shooting, the legislature put policies and procedures in place, had them reviewed to make sure that we could slow down an attacker's, you know, access to our school buildings. I thought it was critically important to say, we will have more attackers. We will have more. You know, we need to make sure if we have policies in place, they're strictly adhered to, they're followed, and we don't get into that false sense of security thinking it couldn't happen here, so it's okay to put a magnet in a door, it's okay to leave it unlocked because of this type of thing, because it is those things that we think of as small and convenient, you know, that allow sometimes things to happen quicker. And I understand that there is criticism of that, but those policies are important, and it's important to talk about them and to say that they did not slow somebody down in this situation. And uh, if it could happen there, it could happen anywhere. It, it is certainly about access to the school that, that would help. That's correct. In your mind, is it also about the access that a troubled teenager has to deadly weapons? Will there be a policy conversation about that? This particular individual had a lot going on in his life. There was all sorts of things that, you know, animal abuse. We talk mm -hmm. about that, or at least the showing of a dead animal, you know, things of that nature. I don't know why the family or the people around him did not want to intervene earlier. I cannot explain that, but as we continue to have broken homes and broken society, we're going to find more individuals like this, and I think it's important to evaluate that. The, the family did not intervene, but in the future, are there ways that the, the state or the law can intervene in, in circumstances like this? We're getting into that wonderful policy question. Yes, we that, are. You know, if, you, if, you, if you give me some period of time so I can pay some respect to this report and the work of the committee. I'm happy to have that conversation, I promise you. I look forward to having that conversation, but let the report speak for itself for a few period of time, and then we'll come back and I'll put the policymaker hat and happy to do that. We saw some reporting um, from our Austin Bureau yesterday that said that some parents were denied entry into the viewing of, of the video and, and of this report last night. Is that true? Are you aware of that? So first off, it was a meeting set up by the mayor and an official with the junior college. Uh, they controlled the list. I, I don't have a good understanding. I certainly did not decide anybody could or could not. I believe there may have been some domestic disturbances between family members of the same victim. I don't know exactly what that is, but certainly there was nobody that I was not willing to visit with, mm -hmm. to share this report with. And when I sat in that room with most of you know, the families that, as I understand it, a, a you know, overwhelming majority of them stayed there and answered every question until basically they gave me the sign that they were done asking me questions and actually want to talk to the mayor instead of me. So uh, you know, that's what I was willing to do and happy to do that. And uh, if there was one individual out there, you know, I, I think I've said this at the press conference, you know, have them call my office, happy to talk to them. Mm -hmm. you know, don't know how they, you know, any of that happened or didn't. Okay, fair enough. What, what comes next for this committee? You, you say in the report that the committee's work is not done. There is still more evidence and material witnesses that you don't have access to yet. What questions still stick out in your mind that we need answers to? So look, you know, we still do not have autopsies back. Medical examiners trying to figure out, you know, whether or not which victims may have survived had there been earlier intervention. Uh, we have not been able to do a complete timeline of what each of the almost 380 officers knew, when they knew it, and what, you know, how they did. That type of work's gonna take many, many months to come back with. 
you know, we also don't have jurisdiction over the federal agents who are there. I mean, the, the, the Border Patrol had the most number of law enforcement on that scene. You know, I cannot compel them to come attend in conference with us. So there is other information out that, and as that becomes available or we look at it, you know, the committee will continue to review that and continue to look at it. Do you think that you'll have all of that information available come January when the next session begins? You know, I, I, I could not speculate. I've heard, you know, Uvalde District Attorney has told people that it'll take long periods of time, and I don't know when that's going to be available. I, I would like to have it available. I'd like to have it available tomorrow so we can look at it, but mm -hmm. I don't know when it's going to become available. All right. Well, we'll keep, we'll keep following this. I really appreciate you uh, running us through this, and uh, we'll, we'll keep following this as it develops. Okay. Chairman Burroughs, thank you so much for Perfect. talking with us. Thank you so much.